The following presentation was recorded at the Buddhist Society of Victoria, Malvern East, Australia. Please visit our website at bsv.net.au. So this morning I'd like to uh, give a, a talk um, and it's a talk that I um, gave actually last week in Perth but <laughs> the sound definitely for the first third to a half of that talk didn't work so I thought it would be well worth repeating it and of course in the uh, process it's changed the talk that I give today will be uh, quite different, well, different in many respects from the one I gave uh, last week in Perth. And the subject for the talk this morning is only the body dies, only the body dies, is there life after death? And it's really exploring what Buddhism says about what happens after we die. And actually the main focus is really just to encourage each of us to look at investigate, look at, is there a life after death? Because it's so important that we have some idea of where we're heading or if we have a view that when there isn't anything afterwards, where we're not heading. <laughs> so it's very important to uh, look at this subject. And I'll focus on this uh, view, this the view that uh, uh, there's a common view that everything ends at death. And I'll give a little bit of background about that. And when we say everything ends, that means the body ends, the brain ends, and what we call the mind in Buddhism. And uh, the consequences of whatever we've done during this life, for us individually, they end as well. And the Buddha called this um, uh, the annihilationist view, the view that everything is finished. Ucheda Vada, he called it. Everything's, Ucheda means cut. Everything is cut completely. It's very interesting. At the time of the Buddha, they had all these views that we think are only modern views. And uh, the important thing about this view and about any of our views, really, is it affects the way we live our lives. And that's why I wanted to talk about it uh, particularly it means if we believe that everything ends at death, that's kaput, finished, then it's a very short-term view. And then we think, well, I've got to live for the moment. It sounds very Buddhist, doesn't it? Or be mindful, live for the moment. But it's actually living for the moment for all the sense pleasures one can get out of this world, all the contacts, the experiences one can accumulate during this life. So this is a tendency that happens. And also, with that view, the tendency is also to think, well, no matter what I do, no matter what I say, there's no consequences. Once I pass away, finished. The slate is blank. And uh, this is counterbalanced, actually. It turned out very neatly because a few weeks ago in Perth at the Buddhist Society of Western Australia, Dhammaloka Centre, Ajahn Brahmali, who's one of the monks from Ajahn Brahm's monastery, gave a talk on eternalism, which is the opposite view of this. Uh, that uh, the view that there is a soul or a spirit, or in uh, Hinduism they often call it Atman, that exists permanently, eternally, cannot pass away. The body dies, yes, but this um, soul, the spirit, this Atman, continues on forever until it finds union with God or Atman, the ultimate. And the Buddha said no, he rejected this view too. <laughs> he said this eternalist view, he called it the Sasatavada view, the Sasatavada view. So in a way this talk is a companion piece to that, that talk about eternalism. If you're interested in seeing that talk, hopefully the sound was <laughs> okay. Um, it was a few weeks ago at the Buddhist Society of Western Australia. And usually I don't talk about these very theoretical or uh, philosophical sorts of teachings of the Buddha because I'm more interested in the practical teachings, what we can take home with us, what we can use in our practice. That's actually the important thing. But unfortunately our views are a very, very important way. They, they point the mind in a direction. And if it's not the right direction, or if it's not a positive direction, it will have an effect on our lives. And when I went to Perth in March, uh, just before the lockdown, actually, 
I was talking to my brother, one of my brothers and his son, and we, somehow we got on to death. And he said, both of them said, they firmly believed, I want you to die, that was it, nothing after that. And somehow when I heard them say that, I was quite amazed. I thought, wow. And afterwards I thought, well, how do you know that? <laughs> that that's the case, you know. And then it occurred to me that many people maybe they accept a view like that without even really examining it. And um, I, you know, the other thought that I had for them was, wouldn't it be good to keep an open mind <laughs> to investigate? And uh, I was well aware when I was thinking that that they could say the same about me. <laughs> Am I just believing uh, what the Buddha, the Buddha told us? But of course. Uh, of course, I have belief in what the Buddha taught uh, and faith in that, confidence in that, but also I've done some investigation. And that's the point of this talk really, is to encourage people to look in to investigating uh, uh, whether there is something after, after life, after death. Is, is there a life after death? Um, and for many people, they think this is the end of the world when they die. You know, that view, isn't it, really? That view that it all finishes at death just means that for that person, the world has finished. And actually, the Buddha often talked in those sorts of terms where the, the world being our body and minds. Um, but it reminded me, I had to find a Nasrudin story <laughs> of Nasrudin. And uh, this one relates to the end of the world. And he said, someone asked Nasrudin, when will the world end? When will the world end? People always ask that, don't they? And uh, he replied, which end of the world do you mean? The greater or the lesser? And the person said, Nasrudin, what do you mean? <laughs> he said, ah, the greater is my death. The lesser is my wife's death. <laughs> I think her view of it may have been the reverse, actually. <laughs> the lesser would have been Nazarudin's death. Uh, so, so the, as I mentioned, this is a, one of the world, this view is very important to um, investigate. And it was quite interesting, a few weeks later, maybe even more than that, two months, no, a month, month, six weeks, yes. Uh, quite out of the blue when I was, I was, uh, I don't know if I was meditating, or just came out of meditation. This thought just came, you know, only the body dies. It was sort of like a reply to my brother in a way. Only the body dies. I thought, wow, that's it, that's it. And then I Googled it, as, as people do these days, to see, you know, because I thought, well, surely if that came to mind, there must be a book, something, you know, with that title. And when I did, I was quite surprised because all the things, or most of the things, nearly all the things that came up were about an eternal soul or spirit. And I thought, that's not, that's not what the Buddha had in mind. That's not the Buddhist perspective at all. So that really, um, that really as it were, um, uh, created or was the background to this talk that brought up this talk. And only the body dies, of course, brings up you know, the, the, uh, the thought, well, what, what is the body and what is the mind? You know, to, to uh, focus on these areas, first of all, before we uh, move on uh, to discuss, you know, what the Buddha said happens or what he, re he, uh, um, he experienced directly happens after death. Everybody knows we can't take our bodies with us. And I know that um, many old people don't want to. If you're old and sick, you wouldn't want to take this body with you. And it reminded me of a monk I know. And uh, he was saying to his mother, who was sick and getting close to death, you know, well, maybe, maybe you'll be reborn. And she said, no thanks, dear. <laughs> I've had enough. <laughs> and I think many old pe older people feel like that that they've had enough. Uh, I did hear one story that I liked when my grandmother was staying in a, we call them retirement village, um, uh, many years ago. And I think she told me, or someone told me at the retirement village, one of the women had died there. 
And her last words as she was going was, everybody, I'm going now. <laughs> it sounded like she was going to a party. I thought, wow, that's a good, that's a good attitude actually. And so uh, she left this life with this sort of very positive feel to it. But it's very important to, to uh, focus on the fact that our bodies are only what I call leased accommodation, rented accommodation, and that this body is only a vehicle or a container for the mind. We put a lot of emphasis on the container and I'll go into that in a minute actually. We focus, as I say, on the container quite a bit and we, our, our bodies, our homes are always are all organised for the body. We have beds for the body, we have toilets, we have kitchens, we have chairs, we have everything for the body. Um, but when you think of it, there's not that much for the mind. In fact, if I say to people, well, you know, are you looking after your mind? Nothing. What is he talking about? You know, looking after your mind. There's some people, and this happened in Perth actually, a, a, a woman said to me, they think more in terms of the heart, and that's possibly okay, because heart and mind are sort of interchangeable in Buddhism. But if we live our lives, you know, con concerned with the body, with the container so much, this is very much the short-term investment. Why? We can't take it with us. <laughs> we can't take it with us. And um, one of the things that it points to very much, and big problem with the body actually, and also to a certain extent with the mind, is we think we own it. We think that we either we, you know, people generally either think that they are the body or that they own the body. And this causes a lot of problems, particularly when the body gets sick or, or um, it ages, it's another time, and when it dies. Because what's happening? It's me that's getting sick. It's me that's uh, dying. It's me that's getting old. And so this is very much a, um, a cause for a lot of suffering in people's lives. But also it, this suffering is not only in these major events of getting sick, getting old and dying. But even during life, you can see, and I see it, so much suffering about how the container looks. <laughs> how the container looks. Is it the right weight? You know, is it too big, too fat, too thin, too uh, the wrong colour hair, you know, balding, or is it uh, what, whatever? And you can, we can see, you know, for everybody who's watching this, I think we're very well aware of it, the advertisers are very well aware of it, how much dissatisfaction and suffering it gives rise to in people's lives. When they compare their container with the ideal container and think that this will be happiness, then when they do that, the sense of judging themselves, judging others, and the sense of low self-esteem if we don't look like what we, we think is we should, can give rise to depression and anxiety. All about the container, because we're identifying with it. And I like to, uh, and also because of that, um, we have a lot of fear, that fear is, especially if that container is about to, to die. If it's sick, yes, fear comes up, um, but particularly at death. And I like to say to people, some of the containers out there are terrible looking, but the contents, marvellous, <laughs> wonderful contents. And that can be, you can think of people we know, I'm sure people know people who've, who's, uh, who are in very difficult situations like a body that doesn't work. And I remember one man in Perth, Hugh, who'd had a stroke and he is, every time I meet him, I've met him a few times, didn't meet him this time, um, he's radiant and I think wow that's that's great because the body not working so well but the mind very happy at home very happy with himself and this is obviously part of his practice too you know that uh, he uh, has developed that inner happiness inner contentment that doesn't rely on the container being a particular way working functioning looking good 
And of course, one of the classic examples I often bring up of containers that don't look good necessarily, but certainly don't work, was Stephen Hawking's. <laughs> now, that was a container that, that was really, we would say in Australia, clapped out. <laughs> but the content's incredible. And uh, for a person in his uh, situation to be one of the major thinkers, really, of the uh, 20th century. And uh, this whole sense of ownership reminded me very much of the Buddha's simile that he gave in the Jetavan, his main monastery, when he was he must have been outside with the monks, and he said, monks, if someone took the branches, the twigs and the leaves, and they took them away, and uh, they burnt them or did whatever they wished, what do you think? They're taking me away, taking us away. They're uh, burning us. They're doing what they wish with us. And the monk said, of course, no, Bhante, we would not think that because this does not belong to us. This is not us. These twigs, these leaves, these branches. And the Buddha said, in the same way, monks, this body and mind. And he's thinking of when he says mind, he mentions feeling, his perceptions, will, and that knowing capacity of the mind, consciousness. He says, in the same way, these are not you, these are not yours, they're not yourself. And that's a very strong teaching, but the difference it can make to a person's life if they don't own this body is extraordinary. It reduces their suffering immediately. And it reminded me of one of the big, the big uh, problems with death for most people is fear, isn't it? Fear is what comes up for most people. And the Buddha in the Dhammapada, he said, he mentions that fear comes from what is dear to us, what we are attached to, he mentions, all that is dear and delightful. And he says quite an interesting thing about the causes for fear of death that, that point to this. And he said the first one is the attachment to experience of the five senses. And this, of course, is seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting and touching. But what does that mean? Well, that means, of course, our family, our friends, our loved ones, our possessions. It means all those things, all the things that we enjoy, that we think um, give purpose to our lives, to many people, footy. <laughs> Somebody told me recently they, they knew the coronavirus was serious because footy stopped. <laughs> so, for sure. But so it's attachment to the five senses, and that's that whole world. It's our world, really. Um, the world of the mind is another thing, the way we develop that, especially if we start to develop the spiritual aspect of our minds. But he said the other uh, fear that comes, the fear, another cause for the fear of death that comes up is our attachment to our bodies. And this is um, because we, it's been our instrument, our vehicle for this life. And we may identify with it so much. It looks, it's me, it's mine. And we've put so much effort into it. And then it's going to die on me. And also, when the Buddha mentions the attachment to the body, one of the big things that comes up for all people, actually, is at death, the fear of pain. That's a big one. They, don't, they think this is going to hurt, and sometimes it does, but in many cases, it doesn't. So that's the second cause for fear that the Buddha mentioned. And the third cause is when people think, especially as we're getting closer to the um, closer to death, is that I haven't done anything good, or I haven't done enough that's good, and this can, um, and they may even think I've done a lot of bad things, actually, a lot of harm. In which case, you know, facing death can be very fearful, especially if they have the idea that. They will, there will be a continuation after this, some, some uh, life after this, this life. Of course, if you think that everything finishes at death, think, no worries. <laughs> no worries. But the Buddha, Buddha said, a person who thinks that will be in for a surprise. 
Um, and the fourth one the Buddha mentions is, and this is mainly for the Buddhists really, is that a person could have fear of death because they think, I haven't understood the teachings fully. I haven't understood the teachings. And what I would interpret that as being is, haven't understood the teachings fully means I haven't realised the teachings. I haven't attained one of the stages of enlightenment, which is a sort of a safety ground for a person. Because once a person has seen the first stage of enlightenment, and this is seeing that there is no self in this body and mind, a permanent self that's running the show, that owns all this stuff. <laughs> well, having seen that, that there isn't a permanent self, then one attains the first stage of enlightenment. And one of the uh, additional uh, things that I think gives rise to fear for people is the fear of the unknown. What's going to happen after this? And of course, that's a reasonable fear. And it's why we need to address it before we get there, to have some idea or have some confidence, you know, unless we already have direct experience from meditation of past lives, um, then we can develop some confidence from investigating. One of the problems, and actually something I'd like to encourage today for people to think about, and this is a practical thing, is the language we use is often a problem. When, when somebody, mostly we say, oh, I'm sick, I'm getting old, or I'm dying. Not many people, I'm too fat, I'm too this, I'm too that. And it really, when you think of it, that language in itself cre creates a lot of fear, because me, it's my identity that's really threatened by being sick, by uh, ageing or dying, or being disappointed that it, uh, this body doesn't look in a particular way. But if instead we have the idea, um, this body, uh, my, well, this body is dying, or we can say my body, but this body is dying, this body is getting sick, this body is ageing. It makes a big difference because we've got a little bit of detachment. We're not being the body. We're just seeing the, the body in a more detached way. And this can actually bring a lot of uh, um, relief from suffering in this life because if we think this is just the body, this is the vehicle, then we won't identify with it. Then we won't suffer so much that the vehicle, the container doesn't look this way that it's going to eventually um, pass away. So this is very, very useful for, um, for us if we use language like that. And, uh, and I know when you're sick, this is particularly useful. This is just the body that's sick, not me that's sick. <laughs> it reminds me of a Nasruddin story I just read, actually. Nasruddin went to the doctor one day and uh, there were lots of people there already waiting for the doctor, so he was late. And he was saying, I hope I'm very sick. I hope I'm very sick. And people were really amazed. He kept going on about, I hope I'm very sick. And uh, they thought, we'd better let him go first. <laughs> Maybe that's the reason he, he was saying it. I hope I'm very sick. And he gets in to see the doctor. And the doctor said, and he says, the first thing he says to the doctor, I hope I'm very sick. He said, Nasrudin. Why do you hope you're very sick? And he said, I'd hate to think what I'm feeling is normal. <laughs> so that's quite, that's Nazarudin for you. But as I mentioned, we we're talking about the short term investment is the body, and uh, the long term investment is the mind. Um, and this is a lovely saying that I really like. I was going to summarise it, but I think it's such a nice saying from Ajahn Chah that really puts the whole thing about the body and the mind into perspective. Keeping in mind that title, Only the Body Dies. And he said, this is from a talk called, very good, good title, Why Are We Here? Why Are We Here? Sounds great. Uh, and he said, now we tend to think these bodies are pretty, delightful, long-lasting and strong. We tend to think that we will never age, get sick or die. We are charmed and fooled by the body and so we are ignorant of the true refuge within ourselves. The true place of refuge is the mind. 
The mind is our true refuge. This hall may be pretty big, but it can't be a true refuge. Pigeons take shelter here, geckos take shelter here, lizards take shelter here. We may think the hall belongs to us, but it doesn't. We live here together with everything else. This is only a temporary shelter. Soon we must leave it. People take these shelters for refuge. So that's a really lovely uh, quotation, really. And it focuses on the fact, yes, we are, you know, as he, as he mentions, you know, we're sort of bewitched by the body. We're so charmed, that's the word he used, and fooled by the body. We're so entranced, is probably the word I would use, with the body, not realising that this is not, not our refuge, not the place that we can find real happiness, real peace in. And, uh, and then he talks about the hall, you know, being full of... Um, these uh, geckos, pigeons, and uh, lizards. The Buddhist Society of Victoria is not quite like that. <laughs> there may be a few other, a few insects, but uh, I don't think any of these uh, geckos and whatnot. But it's still very much the same. The hall is, of course, an image for the body. And then he says, this hall doesn't belong to us. This body doesn't belong to us. We live here together with everything else. And in this body too, there are many things that um, you know, are, are living within this body that we don't recognise, that are part of the body, that this is, as it were, a shelter, not only for this mind we have, but many other um, things in this body, like bacteria. I heard we have four or five kilos of bacteria in the intestines alone. Amazing. So, and it's only a temporary shelter. We all know that. But my heavens, we put a lot of store on it. <laughs> we do a lot for it. But consider not keeping in mind that uh, sooner or later this, this shelter, this body, it will go. And that this is not the place of security, not the, the place for uh, developing peace and happiness, the body. So the long-term investment that uh, we were talking about the short-term investment, but the long-term investment, of course, is developing the mind. And this is very much what the Buddha's emphasis in his teaching is that the mind is the forerunner of all our experience. It's the mind that shapes the world we experience. And I think this is not difficult to see because we know, you know, there are people that we meet and their take on the world, the way they experience the world, is, can be so, so different. So you can have people who are incredibly positive, you know, people who are incredibly negative, depressed, anxious. There are many things, you know, and yet, same world, <laughs> same world, same day. So it's, it's very much our attitude that we, we uh, develop and the way we develop the mind. We take this mind in Buddhism when we travel on. This is what we take to our next life. And uh, it's quite interesting, I know Ajahn Brahmali was saying, you know, well, people say, what, was the, what will the next life be like? You know, everybody wants to know, what's the next life going to be like? And he was saying, and I think very true, a continuation <laughs> of our present lives in a, very, in a real sense. Of course, that depends, you know, if we've been developing very positive states of mind, when we travel on, that's what we will experience. We'll be developing very negative states of mind, that's what we'll experience. It's not uh, incredibly uh, mysterious, really. So it's in our interest to develop the mind in this life and to develop the good qualities which we, will bring us happiness in the next life. In this life, too, and, and in future lives as well. This is one of the good things that the Buddha mentions to the Kalamas, that when they develop the good qualities, you know, and he calls it like... Uh, non uh, like uh, renunciation, this is giving up, letting go, um, uh, developing loving kindness, developing compassion. He calls them non-aversion and non-delusion. When we develop those things, they lead to happiness here and now. He said, even Kalamas, if there is no future life, because they didn't, they weren't sure, he said, even if there weren't a future life, you'd be happy here and now because you've done these good things. 
you know, you're not coming from greed, hatred and delusion. You're coming from uh, these positive qualities. So you have happiness here and now. But of course for the Buddha, he knew from his own experience, personal experience, there, is, there are future lives. And I, th I liken this uh, um, developing the mind to a preparation for a journey. When we go on holiday, when we go somewhere, we usually take a suitcase. And I say to people, do you take the rubbish bin and empty it into your suitcase? No, <laughs> who would do that? Or do you put in the suitcase what you need to take with you? And this is very just a simile for our, for our preparation for moving from this life to another life. Are we going to empty all the negative states of mind we've developed over a lifetime, the negative habits we've developed over a lifetime, into that suitcase and take them with us, with the consequences of when we arrive, it won't be so pleasant, but familiar. <laughs> or will we take positive things with us? Will we have developed the mind in ways that are useful for us when we travel on into another life? Useful for us for developing the ability not to go to another life. And this is actually the aim of the Buddha's teaching. And of course, you know, people, if they thought like that, then they would develop these positive qualities in their lives because they know that this will bring them happiness here and now. And if they had this view that there is something after this, I don't exactly know what it will be like, but that it will be of a similar nature to what I've developed in this life, either positive or negative. And I like, uh, there's one of these free distribution books that people will know about in <laughs> Buddhist centers, Buddhist temples. And it has a very good, very good title. If you want to go to heaven, just be good. If you want to go to heaven, just be good. And I say to people, you don't have to be a Buddhist for that to be the case. You can go to heaven. And if you're not a Buddhist, as long as you're good. And what does good mean? You've developed giving, you've developed uh, morality, You've developed a uh, mind, some wisdom, some understanding. So, and to continue that metaphor of going on a journey, when we go on a journey, most of us will check out where we're going. I would. <laughs> where we're going. Probably these days people Google it or they look. I don't think they look up travel guides so much as they used to. Even Lonely Planet's probably on, uh, online these days, I think. And not only to check out what it's going to be like, but what they'll need when they get there, you know, what the temperature will be, what sorts of food, etc. And I say to people, isn't death <laughs> the biggest journey in our lives? And, and yet, you know, many people won't spend much time investigating, thinking about what's what what is it likely to be like? You know, what can I? Um, how can I um, s have an idea of what uh, what happens after death? And I like a very nice uh, quotation from the Dhammapada. I've always liked. It's a bit chilling the first first verse, but it's it's a, it's a wonderful verse, and I've wanted to, <laughs> to use this for a long time in a talk. And he says, the Buddha says, like a withered leaf are you now death's messengers await you you stand on the eve of your departure yet you have made no provision for your journey isn't that uh, that's quite a it's a very graphic for me graphic image you know because i see all the leaves here in melbourne there's all the leaves <laughs> coming falling from the trees and blowing around and most of them are these withered leaves you know the yellow leaves, the brown leaves that have fallen from the trees. And in a sense, the death messenger awaits you. These leaves are, tell us that. Nature is telling us all the time of this cycle of death and then renewal, death and renewal, passing away. And these leaves are reminding us that, yes, just like the leaves have fallen from the trees, so will this body fall one day. And when we say we're on the eve of our departure, we don't know. <laughs> we don't know when the departure is. That's, 
That's the problem, isn't it? I say to people, if we had a use-by date, that would be great. <laughs> people would say, well, I've, got a, <laughs> I've only got this much time left for this life, for this body, actually. And, uh, but we don't have that use-by date. So our departure can be at any time. So the real teaching is to be ready um, to depart at any time to feel a sense of confidence about what we've done, sense of satisfaction about what we've done, feel happy, you know, of, of what we've done in this life. Um, and uh, of course, when the Buddha says, and you have made no provision for your journey, the provision is, of course, the good karma, we call it good karma merit, all the good things we've done, we've said, or we thought. And this is a very important part, the, the Buddha's teaching, you know, the, uh, the ways we accumulate merit are through our actions of body, speech and mind. And the mind is really powerful because, as, you, as I mentioned, the mind is a forerunner. It's making our world, the world we experience, whether it be a pleasant world or an unpleasant world. After the heavy verse becomes a lighter verse. This is the positive side, fortunately. And the Buddha says, and it's actually about two verses later, but it's a companion in a way. Make an island unto yourself. Strive hard and become wise. Rid of impurities and cleansed of stain. You shall not come again to birth and decay. Isn't that lovely? That's really nice. So this is the, what we can do in this life, you know. Uh, this is the preparation, as it were, for going from this life to another life. And make an island unto yourself. I think many Buddhists will know uh, what the Buddha is referring to when he says that. He's, of course, it's, he often uses that simile, making an island unto yourself, make, as the practice of the four um, focuses of mindfulness, satipatthana. And this is, you know, using for our awareness during the day, during our meditation, using the body, using feelings, using the mind states we're experiencing, and also reflecting on Dhamma, reflecting on reality, uh, Dhamma Nupassana. So this is what the Buddha is encouraging. So to be mindful, to be aware. And when we are mindful and aware, we have choice. We're off automatic. So this is a very um, important aspect to our life. When we're mindful and aware, then we can collect the, the data or data that we, will give rise to wisdom too. We can understand things. And then the second line, strive hard and become wise. And of course, striving hard is um, uh, giving, of course, morality or virtue is, is part of it and meditation, and developing or deepening our understanding. They are the areas that we can strive hard and become wise. And then he says, the rid of impurities and cleansed of stain. And of course the impurities uh, and stain on the mind is desire, aversion, and delusion. And a fully awakened person, and then he says, uh, the last line, of course, is, and a person who's developed this, who's fully um, uh, rid, as it were, of impurities and cleansed the stains from the mind, is a fully awakened person. That's pretty obvious. You shall not come again to birth and decay. And this is for an arahant, fully enlightened person or fully awakened person. This is Nibbāna or Nirvana. So this is what the Buddha um, was mentioning, in referring to in this, this, these verses. I like to uh, liken death to a send-off. I use that. I use that because I think that's such a nice way of look. It's a send-off from this life to another life. We used to send-offs at train stations, they used to have them at airports, they, they sort of still do. Um, people come to go to the airport, often they can't even come in these days. Um, but we have various types of send-offs, they used to have send-offs at ships, didn't they? <laughs> 
And uh, so when we have the idea of a send-off, it's actually a much more positive note, a much more sense of celebrating, you know, the, the life that is passing away. And it, in a sense, uh, it reduces the pain of that attachment that we often feel. And it reminded me, and I think it's quite true, I say it when I uh, do uh, um, give talks at funerals or memorial services, that we may meet again. We may meet again on the other side. <laughs> we may meet again, of course, I think it's from a Vera Lynn song, you know, we'll meet again. And, and they, they had that during the war and that gave the idea of, uh, it gave rise to this sort of uh, happiness or confidence, looking forward to better times, really. But of course, uh, I think for um, when we pass away, we don't know. I often think, and people say this to me as well, you know, that a new child comes to the family and, they say, and people say, wow, so like auntie, so like grandma, oh, isn't, you know, and those sorts of things. And yes, I'm sure DNA has a big part to play, but I wonder whether it is auntie or <laughs> grandmother <laughs> coming back because well, the mechanism for coming back, being a boomerang, is being attracted by all that was dear and delightful in this life will bring us back to those things in the next life, if we have the supporting karma for it. So there's no surprise. I think it's quite likely. I know one of my uh, nephews, I th uh, my younger brother's nephew, reminded me so much of my father. I thought, oh, just like Dad. And I think some of the family thought that too, some of the qualities he had. I thought, oh, <laughs> maybe it is. <laughs> because it's not the same person, just as we're not the same. We're changing from moment to moment, certainly day to day, year to year, we're changing. So... But the important thing is, well, how can we develop this investigation? What can we investigate that can give rise to this sense of um, confidence or uh, that we have an idea of what is going to happen when the body passes away? And of course, there are a number of areas that are very famous and I think well worth investigating. Not only are they famous, they are also interesting actually, um, and there are a number of different interpretations of them, I'm sure. One of the um, uh, most, one of the big areas we can look at is near-death experiences, or they call them end, NDEs, NDEs. I saw this, I used to see this, on the NDEs, what is this? What? <laughs> People like to use these uh, abbreviations. And there's lots of more studies and books about this now, and of course, uh, YouTube has got lots of videos and you'll see lots of different ones. Some that you'll think, well, I don't know about that. <laughs> and others you'll think, gee, that's, that's quite, uh, quite uh, convincing actually or quite uh, interesting. How would I explain that? And I remember, uh, one of the stories I remember is uh, one of the members of the Buddhist Society of WA uh, from Perth. He went on a tour with a group, I was on that tour and we went to, uh, no I wasn't on that tour, I was on a later one. He went to Myanmar and um, he was in Myanmar and he got terribly sick and uh, they were taking him somewhere, I think to a doctor's and he said he had vomiting and diarrhea, so both ends going as they say these days and it was just so painful and unpleasant. And he said, uh, you know, his mind was going inside, everything was closing down sound was getting distant and I think he said that a bright light was coming and he was going towards it and he could feel a sense of comfort and relief, some distance from the pain that he was experiencing. Then, just he was getting ready to, to uh, you know, go even further, deeper into this experience, he heard this voice shouting, come back, come back. <laughs> And it was a tour guide who's a, a real character in Perth. She's a real character, a really strong character. And she was calling him back. And he said, and he did, he came back. And he said he was a bit angry or upset with her because he was coming back to this really painful, uh, unpleasant body that he was experiencing, all this sickness, but he did come back. So it was really a, quite an interesting experience. And this is somebody that I know so I think um, this is 
uh, it gives you an idea, yes, you know, this going towards these near-death experiences suggest yep, something afterwards and generally you know, positive, generally something very attractive. And often these people um, have a sense of anger, you know, at being called back or coming back. They don't want to come back actually, because it's so pleasant where they're going to, and usually the experience they're having uh, where the body is dying is so unpleasant. So that's one area. But the next area, of course, is the main one, reincarnation or rebirth. And of course, people ask, well, what's the difference between re reincarnation and rebirth? People use them interchangeably, actually. But really, a reincarnation relates more to the Hindu idea that there's this uh, Atman, or there's a soul that will be united with Atman in the end. That's an idea of something permanent, eternal, that's going on. And will go through lots and lots of different bodies, but the, the direction is to have this union with Atman, union with God. And of course, rebirth uh, is more of a Buddhist word, it's more of a Buddhist word, and uh, it's, it's a process, it's a selfless process, not a self. If there is no self, people often say, what is the mechanism for being reborn? And the Buddha said, cause and effect. Cause and effect is what's driving this life, our present lives, but also our movement from this life to the next life. It will be a process of cause and effect, which is not a me, a my, a mine or myself. So that's, that was uh, the difference between reincarnation and rebirth. But as I say, people use them interchangeably. And certainly on YouTube, if you type in reincarnation, you'll get a huge number, <laughs> a huge number of videos. And in this area, of course, the famous person for, for his, his, um, his work is Dr. Ian Stevenson, and he's done all this thorough scientific investigation. Some people might find it... Um, too scientific, but it's uh, very thorough. And his successor, of course, uh, I think is Dr. Jim Tucker, and he's written books called Life Before Life and Return to Life, both of which I haven't read. But I've re read Francis Story's wonderful book called Rebirth in Doctrine and Experience, published by the Buddhist uh, Publication Society, not the BSV. <laughs> Buddhist publications, which is excellent and so well written, I liked it. But the main thing, I think, when people uh, say to me, "Well, you know, they want to uh, uh, want to um, uh, encourage somebody to look at rebirth or reincarnation," what book can I can give give them? I wouldn't say give them a book. I'd say go to YouTube and let them make up their own minds, because some of the videos there are just extraordinary. And just to mention, because we're getting close to the end, the uh, one that, uh, uh, one of the most famous ones, it's, it's really stands out, it's extraordinary, is the one of the little boy who remembered being a World War II fighter pilot. And the way that story developed was, the way that came to light was because he was having terrible nightmares of being in that plane as it was, catch it was caught on fire and was crashing. And this was in uh, the uh, Iwo Jima, Iwo Jima battle for Iwo Jima near Japan during the Second World War. And his name was Jane, it is James Leninger, Leninger. So if you look up Second World War fighter pilot, you'll see them. There's lots of them actually there. And even the interesting thing is the fighter pilot's uh, sister, she, she met this little boy and she said she didn't know how he could know all those things. <laughs> And, and he even looked like her brother as well. So, so that's rebirth and uh, or reincarnation. It reminds me of a story Ajahn Brahm tells from a new, it's supposed to be from a US newspaper, but it sounds so perfect that I, I wonder if it's real. A child was supposed to have been born and, it, for, and spoke, children, which is pretty unusual anyway, and it said, Oh no, not this again. <laughs> oh no, not this again, I can imagine. So, and uh, I'd like to, uh, getting close to finishing off, so only a couple of more points. And the other way we can look at, so we've looked at, first of all, 
um, near-death experiences, rebirth and reincarnation, both of which you can check out on YouTube. And past life regression is another way. When people get hypnotised, some people, not all people, remember a past life. And I remember a very old television program from, I think it was from, made in Australia, of a hypnotist who hypnotised four people, four women, and they remembered a previous life. And then they did quite an interesting thing. They took them, these four people, to the place that they had their previous life in. And it was really amazing to see how moved, some of them were moved to tears, some of the information they knew, how could they, they've never been out of Australia, I think, or it said something like that. And uh, it was, to me, very um, compelling, you know, uh, documentary. And it's called um, Reincarnation, there we are, it's called Reincarnation, uh, 1981, full documentary, if you look for it on YouTube, Reincarnation, 1981, full documentary. It's terrible quality, but I remember seeing it and thinking, wow, that's quite impressive. Because one of them, I remember, was a, had been a doctor in a, a medical college in uh, Scotland. And she remembered, she was there and she said, oh, there used to be a door here. And this part of the building wasn't there. And, and when they checked up all the plans, surely enough, there was a door there. There was a stairs going up. Many, many things uh, that she knew. And of course, the last thing, the uh, last way we can check up, and this is where we can investigate, is through our meditation. Maybe this should be the first one. <laughs> and some meditators can remember their past lives. And I know, for instance, in Pawok Saido's uh, teachings, tradition, he encourages people to remember their past lives because many of the monks, nuns, laymen, laywomen at the time of the Buddha could do this as well. But one of the greatest meditators who remembered their past lives was, of course, the Buddha. And he, he not only remembered a past life, he remembered many eons of world contraction expansion. This must be billions of years, actually. And the detail that he remembered is that he remembered his name, he remembered his clan, so his social setting, his social position, his appearance, his food, uh, his experience of happiness and pain, his lifespan and his passing away. So that's, that's an incredible detail. And it... Um, people who remember their past lives tell me that it's an experience. It's not just like um, you know that this was um, yourself, or speaking in figurative terms, in a past life. You know that this, you, this was uh, one of your earlier lives. So I'd like to finish here and uh, just to mention, there was a lot more that I was going to say, of course. <laughs> Talk about the process of rebirth, but that, maybe that's another talk. Just to encourage everyone, myself included, to investigate this important area of what happens when the body dies. Is there life after death? And to investigate some of these areas that I mentioned, like near-death experiences, reincarnation, rebirth, um, also um, past life regressions, and also uh, meditation. And to take, take an interest in this area, because this is where we're all heading towards people. When we have a body, this is what it, the outcome comes, that we have to leave this body. We are, as it were, uh, evicted <laughs> from our accommodation. And uh, as I mentioned before, many people are happy to be evicted <laughs> because accommodation is not so good anymore. So I encourage everyone to develop the contents and not the container, and we can take that with us. So thank you very much, and if there are any questions, we can uh, answer those, well, can answer those now. Thanks, Bhante. So uh, first, Richard. I'd just like to apologise for, um, for our, our transmission today. We seem to have <laughs> no some, sound. It's, it must be a jinx, this particular topic. Got, uh, yeah. Uh, we had some um, uplink problems with our connection to YouTube, so it, it dropped out quite a few times. But um, oh, right. what we'll do is we've got a recording of this, so we'll, we'll have this published um, later today. Oh, all right, thank for you, you everyone, to watch. Thank you. Uh, so this is not a question, but um, it's a comment. Uh, I'm I'm concerned about the people in Minnesota. Can we send loving kindness as an antidote for anger and frustration? 
sorry to be this question. Can we send? Can we send love and kindness as an antidote for anger and frustration? Right, right. Really, uh, for an antidote for anger and frustration, first of all, I think the main, as I often say, is the main point is who needs the, the loving kindness first? We do, <laughs> if we're experiencing anger and frustration. So that would be the first agenda, is to actually um, give oneself loving kind, to soothe oneself, to be one's own best friend, to be kind to oneself. And then it's possible, having done that, to, uh, to radiate that or share that with somebody else. But it has to be, if there is a very, um, uh, a person that we have difficult, very strong difficulties with, we'll need very strong loving kindness. And it reminds me of, if you um, are doing weightlifting in, in a gym, you have to build up gradually, build up your strength. It's no good going for the heavy duty weight and trying to lift it straight away. In the same way, with loving kindness, unless it's very strong, um, there is no point in trying to irradiate, give it to somebody with whom we have a lot of problems or difficulties. So I would suggest, suggest number one, give it to yourself, build it up for yourself, and then it's possible. When, once you've done that, the anger and the irritation, frustration, will reduce anyway. So, and then one can start sharing it with others. I like to share it in a like a geographical way, all those around me, and then further and further afield. And you know, you can think of well, that person <laughs> or persons, they're in this area, but you don't have to go into the details. And that way, you can share the loving kindness like that. Often the Buddha teaches loving kindness, uh, compassion, uh, joy, uh, appreciative joy and equanimity in a very impersonal way that we develop it within ourselves and then just keep radiating it without differentiating individuals. Because if the loving kindness is not really strong, then the in, when we focus on an individual, it can be um, derailed <laughs> and turn into the opposite. We can become irritated again, frustrated, angry. So I hope that uh, answers that a bit. So number one, look after yourself. Emotional first aid. And that's it. There's no other questions. All right, that's good. That's, that's very good. None of them to do with uh, only the body dies. <laughs> Maybe it was too much. So thank you very much for watching today and very nice to be back in Melbourne and to see some of my Dhamma friends. And I'll see more of them next, next uh, weekend when we uh, have a live streaming from, uh, hopefully, from Newbury, Newbury Forest Monastery. So sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Thank you.